Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here, trying out an experiment. We're gonna try to record some audio on my mic and see if I can post that on this video later. So, will it work? No one knows, but uh, the prompt for this video, I've been re-watching uh, old diversity in comics videos and I something clicked when he was talking about SJ, Marvel before SJW, where he was saying there's no point in reviewing such an old comic book. He's analyzing them to try to find good artistic techniques and storytelling techniques. And what clicked for me is the difference between a review and an art critique, where a review is pretty much an up or down, should you buy it or not? And that makes the most sense to do for comics that are just coming out. And then when I'm looking at an older comic or an older children's book, it's a critique where the main point isn't to tell you whether to buy it or not. It's to look for pros and cons, do's and don'ts of storytelling and art. And I just reread this classic children's book uh, and it's given me some artistic thoughts, some storytelling thoughts, and even some thoughts relevant to diversity questions. So, you know, I open it up and the very first thing I read is the book list summary, which mentions that the little girl in the story is a black girl, which is something I had completely forgotten about. I remembered reading the story as a little toddler and it, this is my first time reading it since th those very young days when I was about maybe two or three. Maybe I reread re it with like my little sisters when I was a little older, but it, it's been a while. So uh, I had forgotten that the, char the little girl in the story was a little black girl because I was able to identify with the character as a child and I mostly saw it as Corduroy's story. And then reading it as an adult, I'm noticing some interesting subtext. So uh, the, the first thing I, I'm thinking of when I'm looking at this book is I'm looking at it as an example of good watercolor techniques where uh, there's a limited use of color and an intelligent use of color. And you can theoretically buy like a hundred or a thousand different watercolor shades, but this artist appears to be using red, blue, and yellow and getting all of their shades of colors out of just those three. And what's noticeable in this one is it's primarily red, orange, and yellow. Uh, corduroy is the only bright green thing. Of all the pinks, Lisa, you, we don't know her name is Lisa yet, but later we find out the little girl's name is Lisa. She has the brightest pink dress. Blue is used a little here, but mostly here in a stripe. So it becomes like an arrow. So there, even though it's predominantly red, orange, yellow, that's the most in terms of percentages. Blue is used to give us a rest. Green is used for something important. And intensity is used to call out Lisa as an important part of, of this composition. Uh, the other thing I noticed about the drawing style is I don't think it's scratchboard, but there are white scratches in it. So I'm guessing it might be black pen and then maybe drawn over with white paint or white out to, to make a scratchboard effect. And the result is this creates kind of a sketchy little texture on some of the wood and some of the furniture. And the characters are very simply drawn in a cartoon style. Sometime I might have to talk about the difference I see between kind of the Japanese style of cartooning and the Western style of cartooning, but I think this is an especially a beautiful example of simplifying these characters down to expressive human ideas. So this is a classic children's book. It's been reprint, printed and reprinted a bunch. I want to try to skip a page or two, but I'll, I'll skip later. So. Uh, What's, what am I connecting with? So it's a story of a teddy bear who comes to life and he goes to look for a missing button. And it's such a simple story that the, the, the points of the plot are so basic. But uh, what, what I'm resonating with is I think this is a good example of economy of language. And that's, if you have ever watched diversity in comics videos, mo most of the people watching my channel know what I'm talking about, but I would refer you to that channel for your homework because that's where I find a lot of things that illustrate a point well. So diversity in comics will have this thing where he'll read a panel in a comic book and he'll try to read a whole speech balloon in one breath. And if he runs out of breath, that's an indication that there, it's way too verbose. There's way too many extra words and phrases that aren't necessary. Economy of language means you simplify and use only the words you really need. This, this reminds me of Mark Twain saying that the difference of an extra word can be the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. I, I definitely recommend you just go read some of 
what Mark Twain said about his own stories and writing. He obviously wrote uh, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, but even his thoughts on how to write are, are very fascinating. So uh, th this is an excellent example of economy of language because it's a simple children's story, but it suggests a bigger idea through just really a few little phrases. So uh, it, when, when things shift tonight, the red, orange, and yellow composition diminishes and becomes mostly a blue and black composition to suggest the different time. And I want to skip a few pages so I don't uh, get a copyright strike. But uh, what's interesting about this is just a little side phrase in this page helps establish what Corduroy's character is. So we know he's missing a button and the mom wouldn't want to buy him for her daughter, Lisa, because he's missing a button. And he notices this for the first time and he goes in search of a button. So he has a desire, he has something he wants to achieve, and he's going exploring, looking for it. And even though this is just a bunch of beds and couches, it looks imposing because we're identifying with this little character and everything looks massive from his perspective. And the, the, the one little line in this is he says, I guess I've always wanted to live in a palace. So that's an important line which comes back later and helps establish the theme of this. Corduroy is kind of wandering around. He says, I guess I have always wanted to live in a palace. He, he, he doesn't really know what he wants. He, he just has the idea come into his head like a little child. And I'll, I'll say talking about that for later when we get to the important point. So, you know, he pulls a button off of a bed and flops over and then a night guard comes and looks for him and Corduroy hides and then the night guard notices Corduroy and returns him. So one thing that's interesting about this that I'm thinking about, I think about Calvin and Hobbes a lot by Bill Watterson because I think that's one of the, that might be, a, that might have been the last great artistic comic strip before the constraints of the medium made it impossible for any younger artist to do anything inventive with the daily comic strip or the newspaper comic strip. So uh, what I'm thinking about from Calvin and Hobbes is the ambiguity over whether Hobbes is a toy that comes to life or whether Hobbes is a figment of Calvin's imagination. And you're led to understand that Hobbes is just a toy and he's Calvin's imaginary friend as you read the comic, but there are times where you simply accept that Hobbes is a character and you some things wouldn't make sense if Hobbes wasn't a character who Calvin could talk to. So this is something where when I was a little kid, I just understood it as a story about Corduroy being a toy that comes to life, like Toy Story, like the Nutcracker. But what I've understood now that I've reread it is there's also this subtext that this story might be existing within the imagination of Lisa. I really like the morality of this, that when her mother says she won't buy it for her, Lisa comes and spends her own money on, on Corduroy because she cares for this bear. So it's a good kind of morality story of teaching kids that to value something, put, put your money where your mouth is, save, save up and earn the thing that you want to have rather than just ask for it. And Lisa is identifiable as a character. I identified with her as a child because I was just a little boy who loved teddy bears. But I think it's noteworthy that Lisa is a, uh, is a feminine character. She's not just a generic character. Well, hello there. Hi, I just, I had a guest join me. Hey bud, can you say hi to the camera? Hi. Hi, I'm, I'm reading Corduroy to people. So did I ever read you this story? Yeah. Did you like it? Mm -hmm. High five. Hey, you're supposed to be in bed. Can you run and jump in bed? Say hi, say hi to everybody. Hi everybody. Should they all go read Corduroy? All right, you heard it. All right, go to bed, okay, bud? Good night. I heard some noise. Did you hear me talking or did you hear something else? I heard you talking. Okay, I'll try to be quiet, okay, bud? Go to sleep. Go to sleep. Okay, sorry about that. All right. Uh, so what, what, what's feminine about this character is that, you know, she takes care of the bear, she sews him up, and... She has, a, she has a girlish way of playing with him. Like if this was a little boy, you might imagine a little boy kind of throwing him into the air and playing superheroes with Corduroy or something. But Lisa shows affection to the bear. She takes care of her property. And then in the end, uh, this is what I noticed for the first time as an adult, is that she treats Corduroy as a friend. And once you see that, then 
something connects that her story and Corduroy's are related. The story of Corduroy is he's going on a little quest, on a little mini adventure, uh, because he feels inadequate. He feels like he's incomplete without a button, and he wants a child to adopt him. Uh, he's unsuccessful, but she loves him despite it, in spite of his flaws and helps take care of him. And then we find out that she is in search of a friend, too, and she identifies with this bear. And the, the text, in just a few sentences, helps convey these ideas about the characters. So, good economy of language, good illustration style, good use of painting, and an excellent diversity character, because she isn't a diversity character. She's a character with a personality who is general enough that any little boy or girl could identify with her, but specific enough that she actually has her own personality and her own... it's the sketch of an idea. It's not a fully fleshed out character over the course of a novel, but it is a complete character who goes on a journey and gets a conclusion. I really love this book. I love it even more now that I've read it as an adult, and I definitely think the illustration style is worth a careful look on your part for good color harmony and good underdrawing. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. Catch you later.